Grinder School, what is up? Let me introduce to you today the Spectrum. Now the Spectrum is something that I've been using with a bunch of my students recently to sort of go over how we handle separating our range into different parts and this applies to the sort of situation where someone opens and we are unsure whether we want to 3-bet call or fold a hand from either the blinds or maybe in position or whatever. So, so when someone else is a preflop raiser and we look down at like ace-jack offsuit and we're like, oh well, I don't like flatting this hand out position because people are absurdly tight out position sometimes or we might be like, um, I don't want to 3-bet because then I'll just get lost preflop and all this sort of like sort of confusion can occur of how we should play these hands. So what this spectrum does is, well what it is firstly is the most awesome, in my opinion, method of thinking. It's a thought process and it's a way of organizing your thoughts so that they're logical and so that they don't lead you astray in all sorts of random directions by considering all this stuff that's not relevant. So what it does is it separates hands into four categories as we can see here which are color coded from red being terrible and green being the most awesome of the awesome. There should be more of a difference between that orange and yellow. There's a slight difference in color there but it's not very much. Maybe I could have used a better orange but oh well. Um, so it, it basically grades these hands <coughs> into sections and lumps them together to make it easier to make a decision of what to do. So at the right hand side of the spectrum where it says strong we have the best sort of preflop holdings we can get like queen queen ace king. So as a, like a default it might be the case that you want to only 3 bet a range of queen queen plus ace king. These ha example hands that I've put above each section are by no means um, it's by no means the case that these are always the hands you want to take this action with. It's just that this is a sort of decent starting point to go from so queen queen ace king is very often going to be a three bet value range, you know, against like an under the gun opener, who's tight against three bets. You don't want to be three betting too much more than that for value. So that's your three bet value range, and that includes the very best hands that you can get. And then to the left of that, <coughs> we have hands that are certainly playable against opens a lot of the time. Obviously, depends how. Again, there's a lot of other factors that go into this. Please, whatever you do, do not write down the hands that I've put there and sort of start playing those in every spot because that would be awful. Um, but yeah, these are hands that generally we want to be playing. Sometimes we have to fold, but usually they're strong enough to call, especially against late position opens. But the thing is that they're too strong that we don't want to. They're so strong that we don't want to turn them into a bluff, and that's why our calling hands are better than our three bet bluffing hands. And this is like such a common mistake that people don't grasp is that you don't if you can flat a hand like um King Queen, right? So say you can flat King Queen and you're very happy flatting it, and you don't think it's going to fit into the green category there of three bit value hands. In that case, what's gonna happen is that you want to be flatting it. You don't want to be three betting it. Because the only other reason that you will three bet it is a as as a bluff. And what that's doing is that it's using up one of those hands that you can potentially call and it's turning it into a bluff, which is firstly a big waste of the hand because there are a lot of weaker hands that we can't call with that also perform similarly as a 3-bit bluff. <coughs> it may be that King-Queen performs slightly better than Queen-Jack or whatever, but the fact is it does really well against your opponent's opening range and that's where its merit lies in that it's a calling hand. So to then take that and 3-bet it and say, oh, I just wanted to bluff with this hand, is a waste of a hand and it shows poor range selection and a poor understanding about um, what parts of your range hand should fall into. So basically, we don't want to be wasting hands that are so good on 3-bet bluffs, so what we do is we then call with those and then we use the weaker hands and you'll often have heard the term top of your folding range. And that's essentially, not exactly, not like pure equity wise preflop, but that's essentially what 3 bit bluffing hands are. And that doesn't mean that you take like exactly the top sort of 10% of hands that Stove says have the most equity against your opponent's range, because as you know, or should know, your equity preflop, what Stove says it is, is not definitive. You know, there are a lot of other things that go into hand selection other than raw equity, uh, such as playability, how how often do they flop like draws and semi-bluffing hands that give us sort of barreling and betting potential, semi-bluffing potential? How easy are they to play post-flop? Are they going to be dominated a lot? Are they going to get us into trouble? 
So there's all these sort of factors as well, and these are all going to be relevant in considering what hands we take to be 3-bit bluffing hands. Then we have our folding hands, which as you can tell are just the absolute worst. They're hands that are so bad that because we don't want to be we do not want to be three betting like forty percent of the time because we're just gonna get exploited like so badly um by anyone with half a brain who's gonna realise that we're just three betting any old shit. So because we don't want to be three betting too much, we want to be balanced and we want to be making sure that we do it with the best hands that we can do it with as an overall strategy. So therefore it would be a strategical it might not be a tactical error to three bet king four offsuit because it might work often enough in a vacuum in that one spot alone that it's okay. So it might be the case that it's okay to three bet king four offsuit in a vacuum. But when you then look at the spectrum and look at the bigger picture, what that's doing is that if you're three betting a hand as bad as king four offsuit, it's bumping up your three bet number, your opponents are looking at your their HUD, they're looking at, you know, how much you're three betting and it means that future three bets will get less fold equity. So do you want to dish out your fold equity and you know your limited spots for 3-bet bluffs and your fold equity to hands like King 4 offsuit or do you want to give it to hands like Ace 4 that Ace 4 suited to actually have a shot at flopping decent stuff and not being a complete bluff. So we want to avoid <coughs> what we'd call pure 3-bet bluffing especially out of position. I mean there might be times where we can get away with it in position if our opponent's just folding an absurd amount and it's not going to matter but usually <coughs> that's where the spectrum comes in handy. We can sort of um, take hands in the the ye the orange section there, or the almost orange section. We can take hands like those instead that we know are going to play pretty well, and that's a way of sort of moderating how often we're three betting. It's making sure our three betting isn't getting out of hand because we're just using hands that we've put into that section of our range, and <coughs> yeah, and we're folding the rest. So. How does this, how do we apply this and how does this change based on different types of villains? This is probably the next thing that is pretty important to think about. So, say that our opponent's like a complete nit. <coughs> Excuse me, got a bit of a scratchy throat today for some reason. Um, so, a nit, right, he opens hardly any hands. So, basically his range is a lot stronger when he opens than that of a tag or a lag or a fish or whatever. So what that generally means is that the hands that we can 3-bet will start by at the right hand side here in the green. The hands that we can 3-bet for value aren't really going to be very many at all because firstly he's opening really tight in the first place and secondly if he's a knit he's probably also very tight to 3-bets. So to 3-bet jack-jack against someone that's opening really tight and then continuing even tighter would be a mistake because we're just sort of almost turning it into a bluff, you know, blowing out a lot of those worse hands that it has equity against to call with and sort of wasting it and turning it into a 3-bit bluff would have to fold to a 4-bit. So what that means is that against the net we want to tighten the green area, we want to make that smaller and we might even make it something like King King Plus. So what does that then do to the calling hands? Well it's going to change these a little bit, like what it's going to mean is that we want to be, f we want to be putting more implied odds hands into the yellow section. So what we want is a lot of pairs that can flop sets, because remember against a strong range what we need is a lot of implied odds, hands that can flop really big and sort of stack his over pairs and it's a way of exploiting his strategy, you know, he's saying I'm going to play these really strong hands because I'm going to dominate the hell out of you and I'm always going to have the best hand in the flop, I'm going to have over pairs and top pair, top kicker all the time, what are you going to do about it? And what the smart poker player says is, okay, I won't flat any dominated hands like King Queen Offsuit, we'd probably take that out and I will just flat something like ace king plus and then loads of implied odds hands like pairs and good suited connectors and things that can flop sets, straights, flushes and then what we're doing is we're making our range very easy to play against the net because we're saying okay we're going to either miss the flop or hit it very marginally and then we're going to fold because we're very well aware sir that you're only playing the top 5% of hands so we're quite happy to just fold every time we don't make it set or two pair or better that's fine and we're going to take our yellow our yellow side of the spectrum and we're going to add loads of implied set mining implied odd set mining and straight and flush mining hands to it and that way that when we do continue it'll be because we've outflopped your over pair and we'll take your stack so that's one thing we do to the calling section against the net um, another thing that we're going to do it follows from that if we want implied odds hands 
the opposite of those, what we want to avoid being in that yellow section, are reverse implied odds hands. So we want to, at all costs, pretty much avoid hands like King Jack offsuit. Like these are going to be really bad against the net who's opening, like, you know, tens plus and ace king and ace queen. We don't want to be in there with dominated hands like King Jack. That, you know, if you flop a jack, you're against an overpair a significant amount of the time. If you flop a king, you're against a better king a significant amount of the time. What are we hoping to flop with King Jack offsuit? Well, we're hoping to flop a straight or something, and that's just, there are much better hands to mine with to do that. And we're not going to flop a straight often enough to make it profitable to call and play fit or fold with top pair when we have uh, when we have king jack offsuit. So we want to be adding in the implied odds hands to that yellow section and we want to be taking out our reverse implied odds hands, i.e. the hands that flop marginally and get us into trouble against a strong range. What do we want to do to the orange section against the net, the 3-bit bluff section? So these hands here, so this range here is basically the top of our folding range usually. Um, so, you know, if we're getting hands, if we're getting rid of hands from the yellow section, it follows that they then usually will automatically move down into the orange section because they've been relegated. Think of it as some sort of sports league. These hands were okay against the, you know, the, the lag to flat with. Against the net, they're no longer okay, so they've been moved down. But it might even be the case that they need to get moved down into the red zone, and that's because against certain nets, we just may not have a 3-bit bluff range at all. Because they're opening too wide, too tight, that their range is just so strong that we don't even have enough folds, because just too often they have aces, or whatever. But if they're not like a mega net, and they're just like fairly tight, but they're also folding a lot to 3-bits, then it follows from that that we can use the best 3-bit bluffing hands to 3-bit them a decent amount at the time. And we should be using hands with blockers in these cases because the net has a very strong range, um, and a big part of the net's continuing range is going to be like aces, kings, ace, king, and queens. If we have a hand like ace, queen offsuit, then we're not happy flatting. We can probably bluff with it because it has two very good blockers to queens and to aces. And similar with hands like king, queen, these are going to make very good three-bit bluffing hands against the the net because they, unlike the lag, who has a bunch of hands he's continuing to the three-bit with. The net is continuing, you know, so tightly that the blockers become really significant because they're actually starting to block a large amount of his potential continuing range. So hands with blockers, especially suited ones like Ace Four are suited, these hands are going to be good. Are small pairs good to three bet as a bluff against the net? Probably not. And um, the thing is that they just flop really terribly. They don't have any blockers, so when he continues and we don't flop a set which is going to be like sort of 8 out of 9 times or whatever, then we have no equity to help us see bet or barrel or do anything imaginative, so it really sucks. So there are some situations that we obviously want to have... Um, sorry, my computer just decided it would go into screensaver mode because I wasn't actually moving the mouse about. Um, yeah, so... What was I saying? Yeah, so there are situations where we would like to, to 3-bet the small pairs, but we'll get onto those later. I was going to play some poker as well in this video, but what I'm actually going to do, because I've got so much to cover in the Spectrum lecture, is I am going to continue lecturing you guys about preflop strategy involving the Spectrum, and then this is going to be a two-parter, loosely speaking, and in my next video we're going to play a session and we're going to bear in mind the spectrum. This is how important I think this is. Like I've been literally teaching this to every student recently because I think it's that important. So the next part is going to be us putting our theory into practice because it's, it's all very well to sit and learn about um, a bunch of poker theory and it's all very well to have a nice color-coded diagram even if it is a bit lopsided and wonky and unprofessional looking. But it's another thing to put that into practice and I want to show you guys how I actually implement it as well. So. That's us talking about the net. How do we improve our? How do we modify our folding range, the red zone against the net? Well, we just add more hands to it, basically, and we add more of those dominated hands that we'd flat against the wider range. And yeah, and you know, we may it may be the case that we might be folding low pairs against wide ranges sometimes, and we might add them right into the flat range from the when we're against the net. So it's not always the case that hands have to be like sliding up or down one notch if there's a drastic change in who you're the type of player you're playing against then one might sort of hurdle from one zone 
to another zone that's not adjacent to it. That could happen. Okay, so that's the net covered. What other kind of guys can we come across in our poker exploits? We can come across the tag, um, and the tag is positionally aware, so it's obviously important to see, you know, where he's opening from. So let's just take a, like a tag who's not a total net first of all, and let's say he's opening from early position. So his range is a bit wider than the nets, but still fairly tight. So how do we change the green zone? That's going to depend on his fold to three bit. If he's the type of guy, let's say for argument's sake, that he calls 3-bet 70, no, he folds to 3-bet sort of 68% of the time, so he's calling a lot more than the net. Um, so how do we exploit that with a 3-bet value range? Well, we make it wider than it was against the net for value, and we can include like, you know, ace-king to it, queens plus maybe jacks or something like that. So that would be the line of thought, and the case is that this guy is either 4-bet bluffing sometimes or you know he's continuing a lot wider than the net was so we can we can be in better shape when he calls us by extending our green zone there um, calling against this guy you know much the same from his early position range we want to be set mining we want to be flatting all these small pairs and um, the best of the suited connectors if we're deep enough the deeper we are the more hands we want to extend this yellow zone to that's another point the deeper you are, remember a lot of the hands you add to your yellow zone against um, tight players and tight opens are implied odds hands, so it follows from that that the deeper you are, the more hands you can stick in there. For instance, if we're 100 big blinds deep, maybe it's only the pairs that we want to be calling with, and maybe the very best of the suited connectors. <coughs> then say if we are 200 big blinds deep, then we start flatting with loads of suited connectors and a few suited gappers like Jack Nine suited. We just with the perfectly valid logic that when we hit we can potentially win shitloads of money. Therefore we can afford to flat weaker hands that don't flop the nuts as often because we don't need to be flopping them as often because when we actually do flop the nuts, we can potentially win two hundred big blinds, which is a big difference. If we're three hundred big blinds deep, that's when you might see like the crazy stuff on you might see poker on TV where they play cash and they play absurdly deep and they're just like in there with any suited hands and you know it's the same thing especially if there's a weaker player at the table and when you're that deep like if you're really really deep with a huge fish you should just be playing like anything that can make it straight basically if you're like three four hundred big blinds deep that yellow zone is going to contain like so many hands from the three bit bluff zone and from the fold zone they're all going to be pushed up into the call zone and you're going to be just mining against this terrible player you know if your opponent's good and he's not going to be stacking off like that deep then you can't get away with mining as much but what you probably can do is just flat a bunch of hands and then look to be a bit more active post flop and put pressure on him you know if he's capable of folding then there are ways to sort of respond to that as well um okay so against this guy what do we do with a three bit bluff range sorry we're talking about the the tag that opens an early position so we remember he's not folding so much to 3-bits, that's the thing, he's folding a little bit, so if we have a 3-bit bluff range it really should just be the best hands and it shouldn't be too wide. We shouldn't be 3-bit bluffing too much here, we need to be quite balanced and quite value orientated, but certainly we can throw in a few bluffs because he is folding enough. Um, again, hands with blockers like your suited aces are probably your prime hands, not the small pairs in this situation either, and maybe the best of your broadways that also have blockers and things like that. Um. How does deepness sort of or depth of stack relate to that? Well, a lot of people like to mine more when they're deeper, so you're likely to get less folds um the deeper you get when you're three betting someone as well. So you wanna if you're three betting someone deep, you wanna be picking hands that flop some equity so that you're prepared to fire a couple of barrels and get them off a weaker range. It's not really the case that it's so much like all your fold all your equity comes from pre flop fold equity. It could be the case that if someone's deeper and they're calling you to set mine then you have a lot of marginal pairs that you can get to fold and things like that so maybe you can add a few hands in that case um, folding hands against this guy again same sort of idea we want to be avoiding playing too many dominated hands so all those dominated broadways and bad aces and things like that um, we want to be getting rid of those because they don't have any good implied odds and implied odds are what we need so we want to get rid of those and obviously like we said flat more implied odds stuff Okay, um, so now we'll talk about a late position open and how this changes things up. 
So guy opens on the button. Same guy that we just talked about. On the button though, when he opens in this spot, he really doesn't fold to 3 bets much at all. He doesn't like to fold to any 3 bets really. He folds maybe only 40%, which is a very low amount. And he's just flatting a hell of a lot, and he's also 4 betting a good amount as well as a bluff. So this is like your more sort of spewy, combative, like aggro reg here. So our 3 bet value range, how do we exploit the fact that he's continuing too wide? Well obviously we add more hands to it, so this green zone is going to expand against this guy. It's going to be like, you know, you're going to add maybe like loads of pocket pairs to it. You can maybe start 3 bet in jacks, 10s, 9s, 8s, and then when he 4 bets you can ship them over because he's 4 bet folding because he's bluffing enough or something like that. Um, you can also add more hands that he'll just call you with that are going to dominate him. You know, you could add like king-queen, ace-jack, ace-queen because he's going to defend with like all his jack-9 suited and things like that because he just doesn't like to fold 3 bets when he steals in the button because he knows that he steals wide and he knows that people are playing back at him so he's a little bit paranoid. So we obviously want the looser our opponent is in relation to 3 bets and his opening range but mainly in relation to 3 bets the more hands we should add to the green zone, the bigger the green zone should be. In the yellow zone, we now are not really bothered about all those implied odds hands like we were before. Now the reason for that is that this guy has a very wide range now. So when we take pocket twos and we try to flop a set, which we're only going to do like one in nine times, when we actually flop the set, we don't even really get paid very much because he has a very weak range. A lot of time he's just flopping air, he's just like, he's not going to have a str unless he's insanely spewy and he's going to just stack off all the time with air, if that's the case then we do have implied odds again, but in a different way, in a totally fun way. Um, but usually, wide opening ranges, you're not going to have much implied odds, so we get rid of those hands. Certainly pairs that we can flat are ones that have merit on their own, like maybe 6s+, plus, 7s+, plus, these hands aren't so low that they always flop bottom pair, they can flop like middle pairs and top pairs and they can play okay basically, especially if we've got reads of how to play against the guy post flop. But the main like really nice hands for us to flat, well there's two types of really nice hands to flat. The first is just hands that straight dominate his range. Remember this guy's opening really wide on the button, so you know hands like king queen offsuit is going to be like really powerful, ace jack, ace queen, if we're not 3 betting it, but we may be 3 betting these hands. But even stuff like King Jack, Queen Jack suited, um, Jack 10 suited, that's the other type, is like these really good suited connectors, are very easy to play and also flop good pairs. You know, 10 9 suited, if you're playing that against the under the gun range, then, you know, you're playing it to try and flop a straight or a flush. If you're playing it against the button range, the beauty of it is that you're, pl oh, you're still playing it to try and flop a straight or a flush, but you're also very happy when you flop top pair because his range is that much weaker the top pair, relatively speaking, is a far stronger hand against the button open than it is going to be against the under the gun open. Okay. Um, so 3-bit bluffing hands, how do those sort of change? Well, we don't want to be 3-bit bluffing too much against this guy, that's the thing. Remember, what we've done is we've adjusted to the fact he doesn't like to fold by extending our 3-bit value range. Okay. So we've done that instead of adding hands to 3-bit bluff range. The problem is that if we have a big orange zone against this guy, is that he's just not going to be folding and he's going to be flatting and making life difficult in position and 4-bit bluffing and making us fold. So we do not want to be 3-bit folding with a lot of our 3-bit bluff range. However, that doesn't mean to say that we can't have any 3-bit bluff range. Because, remember, he's 4-betting a lot, so we can exploit that by taking hands that have good equity against his, you know, the hands you'll actually get it in with and by that I'm talking about like small pairs, this is where they come into their element. It's not that they, they're doing amazingly but they're doing a lot better than a lot of these other potential 3-bit bluff hands are. So if our plan is to 3-bit and then 5-bit all in is a bluff, we want hands that are going to do as well as we can get against like aces, kings, ace, king, you know a range like, say it's jacks plus ace, queen, ace, king. We want hands like pairs, because they just do a lot better. Or possibly a suited ace that blocks hands like aces and does okay as well. So suited aces and small pairs, small pairs being preferable. 
those are the hands that we can 3-bet, 5-bet with, and I would argue that against someone who really hates the fold 3-bets, then our only 3-bet bluff range should be these hands that we're using to punish him when he's you know, opening really wide and then 4-bet bluffing, 4-bet folding all the time. And our red zone or folding hands are just going to be this is going to be a smaller zone against this guy because we're able to flat a lot more but anything that's too weak to flat, you know, anything that just plays really far too badly like ace six offsuit is still going to be in there king four offsuit is still going to be in there and lo and behold seven deuce offsuit unless you're playing that game where seven deuce nets you money when you show it and win a hand it's a fun game, seven deuce ball we call it um, if you're not playing seven deuce ball then you should fold seven two as well okay so we've covered the net, we've covered the tag from under the gun, and, you know, we've covered the sort of taggy, laggy, button opener guy as well. Um, so that leaves fish, basically. And there's a couple of types of fish, so first off we'll talk about the really sort of spazzy fish, you know, the guy that's all over the place. Sort of ma maniacal tendencies, far too aggressive and doesn't really think, just sort of mashes buttons and shouts a lot while he plays. You can imagine the sort of player, probably drunk or whatever as well. So against him, what happens to the green zone? Have a think, you know. If you don't do this anyway, it's good to sort of pause and have a think before I before you answer. You know what? Pause now if you haven't been. All right. So that's right. What happens to the green zone is that we expand it again. We want to be building a lot more pots with value hands against this guy because he calls far too wide, and we want to be building pots with strong hands that have equity edges over his range and we can afford to do that much wider because his fold to 3 bets is probably going to be around the vicinity of 0% so if he opens like on the button and he's doing it with like 40% of hands we can probably 3 bet like queen jack suited for value and sort of ace 10 off suit and just like really take the piss with the hands that we 3 bet with because we're isolating him and we're going to have initiative to see bet post flop and he's just going to give us so much money when he flops anything, so we want to build a pot in case we outflop him, which we will most of the time when we have an equity edge, obviously. So of course we want to be 3-betting this guy much wider than we would be 3-betting any of the last people that we talked about. Our calling range, again this depends on how deep you are, the deeper we are. Remember like I said before, if you're really deep with a horrible fish, your yellow zone should be immensely big because you want to be playing as many hands as you can. Um, if you're not deep then Again, we just want a flat hand suit, so are dominating his range, have equity edges. And we can also get away with flatting more implied odds hands than we can against the sort of wide button opening reg. And the difference there is that while the reg has the sense to not stack off with middle pair all the time, the fish will just stack off with random top pairs all day long. And therefore, even though his range is wide, we get paid so often when we actually flop a set or whatever that it's still going to be preferable to us to go ahead and for us to go ahead and do that and set mine a little bit. But of course, it's obviously still better to set mine against the net or ideally the nitty fish. He's like the ultimate because he opens really tight but then still stacks off the top pair. And it's like the worst strategy in the world. Three bit bluff hands against this guy. Let's just not not have any. I mean, we're widening our value range so much that all the three bets are going to be because we're in good shape against his range. We don't want to be taking, like, really weak-ass hands like ace-4 offsuit and three betting them out of position against someone who just doesn't fold post-flop. I've seen people do that in videos before. Sort of, it's a really bad choice of hand. If you're going to three bet a fish, like this kind of fish, you need to be doing it really wide for value. And you can't be doing it as a bluff with hands that aren't doing well enough because you're just not going to get the folds post flop and you're not going to flop well enough post flop and it's going to be burning a lot of money. It's the wrong way to go about playing this guy. So your 3 bet bluff range basically doesn't exist against this guy. Your fold range, again, it's just whatever the hell is left over. Don't really need to talk too much about that, I don't think. Okay, um, so the other type of fish who we might want to consider making changes to our spectrum when we're against is the passive sort of limpy tight passive, not tight passive but sort of not the crazy opening type of fish but more the sort of you know the guy that runs like 26 and just like limps a whole lot and plays a lot of pairs and just doesn't really ever get out of line without the nuts. So against this guy he's probably still kinda stationary when he does open so unlike the net we can probably 3-bet a little bit wider for value 
So maybe like Queens plus or Jacks plus Ace King, something along those lines. Um, in terms of the yellow zone of calling hands, again he's going to be bad post flop. He's going to be probably a bit stationary and stuff, so we can get away with doing a lot of set mining. And also his range is tight when he opens, so this guy is arguably the ideal candidate to add the implied odds hands to the yellow zone against. We really like those to be in there against him. Plenty of implied odds because he's just too bad. You know, these guys usually don't like the full top pair. Top pair is the nuts to most of these people. If we know he's a really weak foldy fish, then we would just not take implied odds hands, but hands that flop draws and just look to punish and post flop for that instead. But we'd assume that most guys with sort of 27 stats or whatever would be would be the kind of guy that would just be a bit stationary. 3-bit bluff hands, unless he's randomly the type that folds a lot. Again, we don't want to be doing that too much. Um, he's not opening wide enough and he's not folding either, so 3-bit bluffing not really too much of an option. And then fold hands, again, whatever is left over. The fold range isn't really too interesting, it's kind of just the pile, the stock of leftover hands that weren't quite up to scratch to make it into one of their one of the other zones. So that's the spectrum and it changes a lot based on who you're against pre-flop and like I said it's the best way in my opinion that I've found of organizing your pre-flop thoughts and understanding it. it's like really understanding how your range works everyone has ranges but there'll be a lot of chaos and disorder to new players ranges because they don't understand that there should be this sort of systematic strategy behind it um, and people do have a tendency to not see the bigger picture they just think tactically at the time like I can 3-bet this 7-3 because he's folding a lot it's like yeah you can but then can you still 3-bet a lot in the future and if not then you should probably wait for a better hand to increase the EV over the long term that's your you know I always talk about tactics and then strategy and the spectrum is very much about strategy and making sure you've got a coherent strategy that sort of presides over like the whole session and what you aim to achieve against your opponents and how you adjust to them so yeah it's pretty important so study it you know take a diagram of it yourself and sort of work out what your own spectrums look like against different opponents. A good way to practice this is to go into hold a manager or poker tracker or whatever you have and look at a hand that look or take an opponent rather, go into your players tab or whatever. Take an opponent, look at how much he opens from different positions, look at how he reacts to three bets, um, look at how positionally aware he is and things. And then sort of formulate a spectrum based on how you would play against them. So sort of say, hypothetically, if I was against him tomorrow, what would my spectrum look like without any other history? And sort of formula formulate one and it just is really good practice. Um stops you being confused pre flop, basically. Which is something that we're aiming for in poker. Alright, so that went on for a lot longer than I anticipated, but I had a lot to say. So I'm gonna conclude the video here for part one. And part two of the spectrum is going to be us. I'm going to do a very, very brief recap where I just flash it on the screen or whatever. And you guys can remind yourselves what it is next time. And then we're going to go straight to the tables and look to apply this thing and really show you what work it does and put it into practice. Okay, interested to think, interested to find out what you guys think about this concept and this kind of video. I know it's not the most exciting presentation. I know I didn't have loads and loads of slides, but I felt it was better just to have this thing on the screen so you could just have a good visual idea of what I was talking about the whole time. So let me know what you thought about that, and I look forward to explaining how we apply this next time when we play a session with this in mind. Questions or comments on the thread, and good luck grinding until, I, until we meet again.